course, as, as you know. So, but his role as a member of the provincial legislature of Gauteng under three different premiers. So, MEC, you are actually like Trevor Manuel, eh? Yeah, Trevor Manuel was president under President Mandela, under President Mbeki, under President Mutlante. He went, he crisscrossed all, more or like our chancellor at VC, who also was President Mandela's minister, and she is, she's remaining in that. We need that experience, we need that continuity, we need institutional memory. And this book here, my children, I encourage you to read, and read with intent. Read with a lot of discernment, read with a lot of critical assessment, analysis. I know it doesn't matter, you're not going to believe what you're told, so I will not say believe everything or not believe everything, but I would like you to read this when you get a chance, because here is a young person who's sharing his experience, his perspective, his networks with us all. He had conversations. When people write books, they often like to write everything from cover to cover. But he took a very modern and inclusive approach by inviting leaders in their own right. And people who were leaders from when they were very young, some of them are still young, but he also went to leaders who are from different backgrounds, different socio-political backgrounds, different socio-economic backgrounds, people even who have different economic and political persuasions to the ones he has. So that ability to be all-inclusive, get the views of everybody, but distill the essence of leadership is what this country needs. It's what this continent needs. And we are hoping that by hosting you here, MEC, you will trigger a conversation, you will detonate a thought process, you will get our young people excited about reading, but most of them are leaders in their own right here. You will also challenge them to not think any less of themselves. You will challenge them to imagine what could be and remember that possibilities abound when you take responsibility. Maxwell, John Maxwell said, everyone has talent, everyone, but talent is never enough. That's the title of his book, actually. And he says, one of the things that you need to shape your talent into a super talent is practice. That it sharpens your talent. And purpose directs your talent. So he has 13 things that you say you must do. So I hope that you'll be able to get enough practice. I hope that you'll be able to engage the MEC but he's first going to do a dialogue with our VC, who is himself a leader from a very young age, and he has traversed the different epochs of this university, and he's still here. He has done very well for the institution. He has helped it to grow from 8,000 students to 23,000. He managed to take it from under administration in 2002 to where it is today. All of you are not feeling like you are at a poor university because of the leadership that he has been able to grant the university and the higher education sector. Thank you very much, MEC, for honoring us. And I think at this point, I'm going to ask Donald Selamulela, who is the president of our Alumni and Convocation Association, to come and guide us. But before that, we need to, I think, rise and sing the national anthem. But let me hand over to the moderator for the day. Welcome, Donald Selamulela. Uh, our executive director, thanks very much, Dr. Uh, Even before I can come start with salutation, can we all rise and sing the national anthem? I'm not sure, Marera, if you are doing it uh, through audio or uh, someone with a powerful voice can lead us. <laughs>
Uh, thanks very much, colleagues and <coughs> program director. Thanks very much. Once again, allow me to start by recognizing the Prof. Madashi, the Deputy Chair Vi Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning in the University, our Register, Prof. Gwenamasha, uh, Executive Dean of Faculty of Humanities, uh, Professor Mautu. Uh, Professor Dikeleji Matro, the Director for Rakhona Disability Center, and once again yourself, the Executive Director for Marketing and Communication of our University, Tate uh, Homeswan. Also to recognize, as you did, the leaders from the ABC, from the SRC, and everyone present here, the team that came with uh, one of our participants, Ms. Maile. I also want to recognize yourselves and greet you. And Dr. Homeswana, this is a very, very important day, I think, in the life of university. And we really want to appreciate the continuous dialogue you are having in this university. Comrade Lebogang, a week, uh, if not three weeks ago, we had uh, Lincoln in Mali. You would know Lincoln in Mali from the student struggles. He was also here because the university is continuing this engagement so that it continues to empower the young people of this institution in its endeavor to contribute to finding solution to Africa as a continent in line with its motto that it will strive to find solution to Africa, the challenges face that faces Africa and her children. And I think it is against this background that we are also here today to engage rather in a very different uh, way today of a dialogue uh, with young people. And uh, I must also indicate that as we will be introducing to you the, the speakers, the invite that uh, Dr. Homeswana has made is that indeed you must also read this book uh, even beyond today so that you can have continuous dialogue beyond today's dialogue amongst yourself uh, in the book clubs, in the debating society, in your leadership forums and so forth, so that you can continue to empower yourself. We are presenting to you Comrade Lebogang, as I would call him, as we affectionately know him within the rank as Comrade Lebogang. Comrade Lebogang is that Commission indicated is the current MEC for Human Settlement and Infrastructure Development in Gauteng. He has traversed the way of youth leadership. And to us, those who have been within the rank that Comrade Lebogan traveled, we consider Lebogan a leader, Comrade Pet, of a generation. So when you say in your quotations that every generation must find its mission, ful fulfill it, live it for it, fight for it, or fulfill it, and so forth and so on, when you quote, make those quotations. As a generation, we have bequeathed that responsibility of leading and determining that to Comrade Lebogan Prof. And it is not by mistake that he has contributed in a different way because at the dawn of democracy, Comrade Lebogam became the president of Congress of South African Students, COSAS. And it was at the time when the transformation agenda was at full blow in the country. And he was at the center of ensuring that the South African Schools Act reflect the aspirations of the previously marginalized students of the country, the black majority. And all the youth of South Africa, the students of South Africa, looked upon this speaker I'm about to present, because I can't introduce him to you as your leader, to present to you. But he also served as the member of the executive committee of the ANC Youth League in Gauteng, provincial executive committee in Gauteng, he led Gauteng, became the secretary, and also became the provincial chair of, that, uh, of the Youth League. But most importantly is that administratively also, 
He served as the chair of the Youth Commission. The Youth Commission is a predecessor of what you today call the National Youth Development Agency. So at the dawn of democracy, when the country was not sure what machinery must we put in place uh, to empower young people or to facilitate development of young people, we, the country took a decision that it will establish what you call the National Youth Commission and subsequently they also established to support the Youth Commission, Umsombov Youth Fund, which then later made to form what you call today the National Youth Development Agency. And Comrade Lebogang was part of those particular developmental dialogue at a very tender age. As indicated earlier, he also became the, minister, the MEC. He served first in the legislature in various portfolios in education, in finance, and, and scrutiny and subordinate legislative committees. But further, he also served in 2010. You would remember that in 2010 is when we hosted the, the World Cup the global spectacular event here at home. And the center of that particular World Cup, as much as other provinces were hosting, but Gauteng was at the center. So Comrade Leborang was bequeathed with responsibility of carrying the legacy of that particular World Cup in that particular province forward, of course, together with other administrators. But even then, his greatest interest was more on libraries, on having more young people getting to read and so forth. He became the MEC for Economic Development. Prof, one thing unique about Comrade Lebogang, which must be mentioned here, is that in his, all his responsibilities, he always believed in young people. We, in this province, when we started to see that young people can serve in boards, we saw Comrade Lebogang appointing people, young people from this province, by the way, and most of them, alumni of this university, to serve in the boards in Gaudi. And I think he deserves a round of applause for that. <laughs> so, his articulation of what youth development must be about, he's, we have also seen him practicalizing it, living it in practice, uh, Prof. And that is why it is easy and it is always appreciative for us to interface and find ourselves in a space with him. I'm deliberately saying this so that as these young people read this book, they are able to locate this particular speaker and this particular participant very, very well. Uh, importantly is that he is currently serving as the MEC, as indicated, for Human Settlement and Infrastructure Development, but he's also the Vice President of Forum of Regions of Africa, where he was elected last year, September, as the Vice President. Uh, he was elected in a city which took place in Saidia, uh, in the Casablanca state in Morocco. He has a postgraduate diploma in public management from the University of Witwatersrand. Now, Comrade Lebogang, you are welcome. As a leader of a generation and as a trailblazer, he knew that the issue of youth development we can speak about it, but someone must write about it. For sure, he's the first young leader of a generation, Comrade Pet, who wrote a type of a book that he has written. Because true to the English say that until the lion has his own story writers, the story of the hunt will always praise the hunter. Now, Comrade Lebogang has come to practicalize through this particular conversation and drawing experience from various participants in the book, what it means to be a youth leader. I want to take this opportunity, Comrade Lebogang, to welcome you in the great University of Limpopo, where we are in pursuit of knowledge search, and in our, all our endeavors, we are centered around finding solutions to Africa and her children. You are welcome. Round of applause. <clears throat> Prof, Comrade Lebogang, hmm? I'm going to introduce you, Prof, and, <laughs> and I have a reason because, you know, I never have an opportunity to speak about you. The last time I tried in the last council to speak about you and they were saying I'm biased. So I must mm -hmm. speak about you because I may never in this lifetime have an opportunity like this to speak about you. 
But Prof becomes a very, very relevant person, Comrade Lewan Trevi, this particular discussion with you in this dialogue because he would have assumed the responsibility of running this institution, a very complex and dynamic institution, which underwent various stages. And I was with Prof. Masha in Namibia, where the convocants of Namibia have said we must really pass high regards to you and thank you for having kept their alma mater alive because they say to us, for as long as the University of Limpopo lives, their stature and standing in that country continues to live and they continue to be respected. To that they said we must pass a regards to you. We are with Prof. Masha and the team over the weekend when we were launching the chapter of alumni in Namibia. Uh, Comrade Lebogan, Namibia becomes very, very important why we are there because when Swapu came into power in 1990, majority of the young people who built the administration in Namibia were the convocants of University of Limpopo. So that includes the deputy judge president who was part of the alumni and he said we must pass regards to you, Prof. He is the current deputy sitting deputy, deputy judge president of Namibia. He's a convocant of this particular university. He has made a commitment that he will visit the university during the spring in inaugurations. But why Prof is very, very important is because over and above the fact that he, he took responsibility for this university, he took responsibility for this university at a time. At the same time, Lebogang, you were leading a transformation of higher education, of education. He was also charged with a serious responsibility. That was the time when we were discussing the size and shape of the higher education terrain in this particular country. When we were merging and there were a lot of up and downs around the matter. So he transformed the university from 1990 until at least 2000. University was, this university was never stable. I think we must say this. For sure we had changed VCs. <laughs> I don't know how many times, more than 10 times in a space of a decade. But since he assumed responsibility, we had a stable university until today. We have never had a chance of taking this VC in and out. We had more than 10 VCs uh, in that particular 10 years. And that was a terrible time because it was coinciding with the time when the country in itself was on a transitional space. So when Prof took over, as we're dealing with the size and shape of the higher education terrain in the country, it was at a time when also Comrade Lebogan was seized with a serious responsibility of transforming the secondary level and primary level education in this particular country. So they are very, very important people that indeed you must listen to. I personally wanted to come and sit and listen when Dr. Uh, Khomeiswana invited me. I said I will shelve every other thing to come and sit and be a participant in this particular dialogue. So I want to take this moment, uh, Prof, welcome you, a uh, round of applause. I have said what these colleagues did not know about you. I could say more, but I think you are welcome, Lebron. You can come and take your seat. Prof, you are also welcome to come and take your seat here, as we'll be starting the, the conversation. So our dialogue is going to go this way, colleagues. They'll make inputs, they'll respond to each other. We are going to allow you to come in on questions and also on comments. And then uh, we'll then give you direction on what is going to happen. I think you have your own yeah. gadgets level, you're fine? Yeah. yeah. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Let me leave it here. Put you under a stable chair. I think you can still take it down a bit. A, no, while while sitting. There. <laughs> okay, stability chair. No, while sitting. Yeah, there. yeah, you can just take it down a bit. <clears throat> yeah. Where's your chair? Is this thing on? Huh? Should be. Yeah, it's on. 
Yes. As they are fighting technology, I must indicate that you are welcome to use the restroom at the back. Uh, at the back. And immediately after we are done, you must remain seated because we need to have a particular conversation with you. Thanks, Program Director. I think you have all been greeted. Good morning. A special word of thanks and welcome to Honorable Lebocham Maile and Pep. We have seen you through rough times. Now today you, you are here. Let, let, let me start by, because I might forget when I'm going to be trapped in conversations. Thanking and congratulating Lebocham for having come up with this thought-provoking book and even the way in which he approached it. Never too young to lead. This morning as I was coming through, I was thinking of many other things that can be said about never too young to lead. And I realized that even at primary school, leaders showed themselves. You know, during our days, they would give you the responsibility of checking and writing down the names of those who were making noise. <laughs> Though you're going to be beaten for that after school, as you go home, but you'll have done the job. Through high school, we have got organizations like courses. Over and above being prefects who are leaders, then there are those who will be elevated to those higher echelons of leadership. You come to university, you find them now trying to define themselves, trying to find some homage for them in the political situations which we are having. But having said that, I think the, 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 the idea of never too young to lead, there's a way in which one can approach it. And I believe the young minds which are here, if you look through history, especially, say, the history of the University of Limpopo, Many young people sort of elevated and demonstrated their leadership capacity, leadership qualities during their early days. Currently, you can do it by being thought provoking, thought leadership, coming up with ideas that will shape and lead us into the future. You, you know, when you look at our country, you can identify a number of mega events, mega trends, which were introduced by young people. The, the latest one which we can all think of was the fees must fall. It just clearly indicated that young people stood up and said, it's not that we don't want to pay, but these fees are just too steep and unaffordable. And government, together with the university leadership, uh, they, they did listen to that. And we ended up with some sort of normalization of higher fees in higher education. That was started by 
young people. That's why I say somewhere, think of it in terms of thought leadership. Identifying mega trends in the way, in our lives and in the way we do things. You know, I've been with the university for quite some time. Abraham Hoputetiro complained and lamented bitterly about the education system in the country. Following that, we saw a number of events which then one can say ended up correcting our education system like where we are today. 1976. The youth stood up to say, could, could we look at the way we're doing things? Is it right for us to be forced to study in a foreign language? You know, you, you, you struggle with concepts, but when you're going to struggle with those concepts in a foreign language, I think it's just killing it. So young people always, uh, Honorable MEC, come up with ideas which will sort of, I mean, shape the future of the country. There's no way we can speak about leadership of young people without touching on digital transformation. You know, we are in an era of digital transformation. All of you here have got those gadgets. But then, moving forward, how do we transform the way we're doing things to sort of accommodate with the trends that are there? You know, we, 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 the, the other day we were debating about this that chat, chat GPT. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the things which is going to give academics a run for their money. And the students are, are moving ahead with it. Give them an assignment, they go to their gadgets, <coughs> chat GPT. They say, I must write about this. It comes out just like that. <laughs> now, it, it, it shows something, that we must change the way we have been doing things. Change the way we've been thinking things through. For students to leave the university with those degrees, with the papers they are written on, they must leave the university with a certain amount of knowledge. Now, how do we go out to tap that? How do we go about in the face of our digital transformation to make sure that we, we give them what is worthy of doing? You know, with ChatGPT, you, you can just sit at home, I think, and ask it questions end up knowing what it is. Even last night I was playing around with it with a colleague. You ask it a question. Can you compare a donkey and a horse? Chat GPT will give you pages and pages on that. <clears throat> That's why I say it, 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 it's incumbent upon us as the old God which is going out to understand what the young ones are doing. Uh, Honorable Emissi, one thing which I think made me stay longer in this position as Vice Chancellor, somewhere in my first few years, I adopted this motto which says there is a lot of agreeing with it. There's a lot of madness in 
young people's thinking. But then, don't just end there. Try to look at the thinking in their madness. They've got a lot of madness in their thinking, but go further than that and look at the thinking in their madness. And I think that's where we get it. I'm happy we're here challenging them to say it's never too, you, you, you're never too young to lead. And I'm happy they brought you and Doso here just to show that you can be young and still lead. When I took over one council member who was delivering the inauguration speech when the university was really in turmoil, he said, good people, I think we must get a young scientist to run this place. And it did happen. <laughs> and that's where we are here today, with a stable institution, viable institution, and that's it. So, Honorable MEC, the challenge is that as young people, you, you, you saw the old guard, you can outsmart them with ideas. You, you just have to do that. I mean, whoever thought, I mean, we were there, we didn't worry about fees, but the young people are the ones, they, they were not even the payers. The people who were paying were the parents. But the young people said, after seeing what is happening in the homes, I think this is just too steep. We cannot continue paying things like this, and that's why we had fees must fall. And you can look at the different eras in our history as a country. Most of the things came from young people. So it is true. It's never too, never too young to lead, and come with those ideas. You had the right to university, the University of Limpopo, where we pride ourselves by saying, we are the University of Limpopo for human and environmental wellness, finding solutions for Africa. The environment and human wellness, if you look at how it is with us, we don't differ from our neighboring countries. Hence why I was excited to hear that the alumni of Namibia is doing well, and most of them studied here. You look at the, the, the South African body politic, most of them, they cut their teeth at this university as young people who were from time to time, you have to guide them. That's why I say, you look at the thinking in their madness, you say, no, let's think of it this way. And it goes on the right track. Honorable MEC, congratulations and thanks for having come up with this thought-provoking idea which you put together in a book. And I agree. It's a very lovely book to read. Especially the way it's structured. You know, it, you can have a book being written by one person, but here you read it as though it's a number of people who are throwing their ideas into it. But as I say, we have facing a number of challenges. Climate change, how do we deal with it? I'm, I'm, I'm sure if, if, if you look at the number of pollutants which are there. The other day I was watching TV, because of the way people are so reckless with the environment. There's a place, I just forgot the name, but sewage effluent got into the river system, polluted that whole dam, and fish started dying there. Now they were having problems, how do we get rid of this dead fish? The best thing is just to dig a hole and put them in there because some of the sewage if, I mean, effluent was from the hospitals. Now you know hospitals, you get every sort of thing. Biological bugs there, 
chemicals and everything. Now, if people are going to eat that fish, they're definitely going to have problems. So, that's it, Mr. MEC. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, thank you very much, um, VC. And uh, <clears throat> let me also acknowledge the deputy VC responsible for learning and teaching, uh, and the executive director responsible for marketing and communication, <clears throat> and uh, the president of the alumni. And. Uh, everyone who's here, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming through and thank you for welcoming us <coughs> to your university. Um, this is a very important institution in our country. As the VC has said, it has a special place in the history of our country because of its role in the struggle for freedom. It has produced a lot of uh, uh, reliable, uh, patriotic, committed uh, South Africans who are continuing to make a difference in our country. It has produced ministers, premiers, and if I'm not mistaken, I think the governor of the Reserve Bank is from here. No, no, he served on the council. Oh, he served in the council, yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. it has produced a lot of uh, eminent uh, South Africans. So it is a, a special place. And that's why it was a no-brainer for us to come here. This is the first institution we are visiting outside Gauteng. We have been in Gauteng because that's where we are based. But uh, the first visit we made out of Gauteng was this institution. Um, and we are happy that we are here. We are also happy that we are going to have a conversation with yourselves and we don't want to uh, say a lot of things. So this is not a lecture. I know you are students, so you are used to being lectured uh, by your lecture. So I'm not a lecturer. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, I'm just an activist. But I think it's important perhaps to take you through the book so that you understand what it is about. And I was explaining to the VC earlier on that uh, this is a project, so it has got different elements. But when I decided to write this book in my early 20s, uh, I had a lot of thoughts as to how to structure it and what to communicate. And it's tempting to talk about your background, how you grew up, poor, no and tell you no shoes, eating cabbage, and <laughs> complain, Mautuana, and everything. And all of us are from that background. There is nothing uh, interesting about that. Uh, <clears throat> we just need to uh, work ourselves out of poverty. And that's why education is important, and we must acquire knowledge and skills and all that. So I came to a conclusion that no, maybe I must engage with uh, several individuals based on their contribution in our society. And I'll just take you through now uh, uh, who are these individuals briefly and what they are talking about. Uh, but before I take you to the individuals, this was inspired by my own story. So the book was also inspired by my own story because when I was elected president of COSAS, a national president at the time, I was about 15 years old. And there were a lot of people who felt that, no, I'm still very young. I can't be a president of uh, such a powerful national organization. And that's an organization which has played a very important role in the struggle for freedom since it was established in 1979. And people thought, no, no, no. Uh, this man is still here. Because in the early 80s and mid-90s, sorry, 80s, sorry, 
and up to the late, no, early 90s, uh, most of the people who were leading courses were people who were no longer in school because they were instructed to go back to school to mobilize and conscientize young people. Hence, it was difficult and it appeared strange that a 15-year-old will... Uh, oh, you want me to speak through this? Yeah. Okay. Hence, it was strange that uh, a 15-year-old will lead this national, powerful, radical organization that had a presence and a footprint throughout the country. I then stayed for three terms. In fact, I think I'm the youngest and the oldest serving president of COSAS. Uh, then post COSAS, I was elected as a secretary of the ANC Youth League in Gauden. And still, people are saying, no, this man is still young. He can't be secretary of the ANC Youth League. Then later, Chairperson, they said, even worse, he's very young, he can't be. And then youth commission, they said, no, this man is young. And then uh, 2010, in October, no, in November on the 3rd, I think I was 31 years at the time, I was then appointed to be MEC for sports, arts and culture. And there's been people who have been in the legislature long before me, and they felt, no, 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 this person is very young. You can't have an MEC who's 31 years old. Mm. You know, because people thought no, to be an is about being driven and all that. And it's more than about that. It's not, it's not about that. So then became MEC, the rest is history. I'm now 13 years as an MEC uh, since, since 2010. Then last year, I, I is it last year the conference of the ANC in Gaudé. Then I contested for to be the chairperson of the ANC in Gaudé against the current chairperson and premier. They said no, but this boy is young. <laughs> uh, and and mind you, I'm 42 years at that time. I've got a family, I've got kids. But they say still you are still young. young. So throughout, and I guess that will always be seen as young. I mean, our parents and those who are older than us will always see us, see us as being young. So I'm giving you this history to show you that throughout, I've been doubted on the basis of my age. And throughout, I had to prove myself and uh, work hard because I understood that I don't represent myself. I represent a generation. And if I fail, they will say, you see, these people are not ready to lead. So I had this op a, a, a huge responsibility now uh, bestowed on me uh, unintentionally, uh, unplanned. And now I'm carrying the generation because if I fail, it means everyone in my generation is not capable. So hence, when I sat down, I said, no, but a book that is talking about uh, leadership, not just young people, leadership, but how can we coin it? Hence we came with this concept of never too young to lead, because we've always been accused of being young, and, 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 and we're not supposed to be given an opportunity. So that also informed the kind of uh, contributors I must uh, identify. If you look at the, uh, what we call the, is it the preface? It's done by the forward. Uh, it's done by Dr. Ivan Koza, the owner of Orlando Pirate. If you sit with Dr. Ivan Koza and he explains to you how he became involved in Orlando Pirates, you will then understand, because Dr. Ivan Koza became, uh, his involvement was by accident. It's an accident of history. It was never planned. Because he was a student who was expelled from Fort Hay, uh, they wanted a secretary for Orlando Pirates. So they needed somebody who can read and write. Though he was not a graduate, but because he had uh, tertiary training and education, he was 
then given that responsibility to be the secretary of Orlando Pirates at a very young age. And there's a lot of stories he tells about how he got to where he is. And I will not bore you with those. And it's very interesting because Pirates is a very complex soccer team. Uh, I don't know who supports Pirates here. Yeah? Uh, some other day. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very complex team. <laughs> so, so, so I thought he must uh, provide the forward, but he's also working with young people on a daily basis because soccer players are young people and all that. And that's why when you look at the forward, you see and you realize how passionate he is about our country, how he's committed, and and all that. And then there's a an interesting young person called um, <coughs> Melita Ayaka. She's based in the Western Cape now, but she's originally from the Eastern Cape. She's, she took interest in climate change, uh, or rather environmental issues, when she was about 17 years old. Her peers, her parents, her teachers, and friends did not understand why would be she interested in such a not so important. Not so important because what is important is poverty, is unemployment, is crime, you know. They never understood. And for me that stood up that at a very young age and she was courageous to take up a very complex, complex uh, uh, issue and championed it. And today she's 21, I think 21, 22. She sits in the Presidential Climate Change Commission. And in the book, she explains how difficult it was for her when she went to these meetings with older people. And she's, she's the only young person. These are professors, they are doctors, they are subject interest, uh, I mean, um, uh, specialists. specialists. And she's very young and passionate and just courageous and how intimidating it was so you will get the book you will read the story it's very uh, it's a very interesting story of this young uh, person and she has she has uh, represented the country in different platforms throughout the world and then okay i'm i'm writing about something there called demographic dividend uh, which is what we call generational uh, mix uh, how the young and the old must coexist. And then there's an interesting uh, chapter about education and transformation. And I think you must read that by uh, Mary Metcalf. Mary Metcalf uh, is a former MEC of education in Gauteng. In fact, uh, I, in the book, I didn't take you through the introduction where I explained a few things. Uh, one of the things I explained is that I failed my metric first time. It was Mary Metcalf who gave me uh, an opportunity to go and finish. And, and what is interesting, the irony about it, she, she gave me an opportunity to go to a private school, not just a, 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 a I'll say a lily white private school, which was Crawford College. And at that time I was the president of COSAS. COSAS position was to abolish private schools. So it was a contradiction. <laughs> I had to report to COSAS and we had a discussion until early hours of the morning to discuss whether the president of COSAS must go to a private school. Uh, and you know, Donald, in that uh, NEC, I always tell people, and deliberately, I'm telling them, one of the people who were in my corner was a the, 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 the fighter himself, the, the, the Julius. socialist, yeah. Julius, he was saying, no, the president must go to the private school. Uh, it's important. And we went to the private school, and I think in hindsight it was a correct decision. Because we got to understand the gap between them, because we've been talking about it in theory, and that strengthened our resolve. So that chapter, Mary Metcalf speaks about that, and then there's Professor Marwal, who talks about, uh, we were coming from the artificial intelligence uh, point of view, because you know, he's a, 
he's a, he's a specialist and he's passionate about it. So his uh, chapter is titled, Those Who Don't Read Don't Deserve to, to Lead. <laughs> so basically he's arguing that leaders must read. You can't want to be a leader and you use common sense. You don't read. And then there's a doctor, because I want to move quickly on those things, Dr. Sidney Mufumadi. Dr. Sidney Mufumadi was uh, 1994 in the Mandela cabinet. He was uh, one of the youngest, I think he was 34 years or so. When he got into the cabinet, he was only having metric. In fact, I don't even think he had metric uh, when he was in cabinet. A few years later, He's a doctor now. He's got PhD. And I thought it's an ins inspiring story. Because someone who would have been a minister would have lowered their guards because they would have had a good pension, good networks. So yeah. why would I have to go to school? And I'm old and all that. And that chapter is titled Never Too Old to Learn. He's talking about Mandela, how Mandela learned about leadership and, in fact, about governance for the first time when he was president. Basically, learning on the job and the mistakes that he made and all that. So it's an interesting chapter to read as well. Um, and then you've got Fasia Hassan. Fasia Hassan was one of the activists who led the, the Fees Must Fall movement in, 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 in vets. There were others, of course. But when you read through that chapter, Fasia, uh, Fasa, uh, Fasia Hassan, you will realize that there were a lot of elements and dynamics that as society, as people who were not in the space did not appreciate and understand. They have to do, for instance, with class. The fact that Fasia and some of the leaders were from middle class background, meaning their parents could afford to pay fees. But they consciously decided that we are going to be in solidarity with those who can afford to pay fees. It's not about us. There was a, there was a, a racial element because the, the, the overwhelming majority were affected. It's Africans. And she was Indian with others. And others were saying, but you are Indian. How can you lead a revolution of Africans? Then there was a gender. Because what is important about that chapter is what I would term as a cultural revolution. Before, quite during the 90s, there was a, a, a music genre called bubblegum. I don't know if someone's about their condition, living conditions, and also displaying, I think, um, their defiance against the system and mobilizing and conscientizing themselves. And that's why a whole range of songs that we have said. Uh, before Nkosi Sigelela, before we had the national, what we call the national anthem with the three uh, uh, things, post-94, they sang Nkosi Sigelela. But, but they brought the quite of vision. And uh, the, the older people were not happy. They thought that was the vulgariz vulgarization of the soul. Hence, they were called to order. Uh, they sang about Madiba's divorce. Madiba called them to order. And they were vulgar as well. And a whole range of things. But what is important about that which they did was that they, were, they started a new genre completely, like this my piano guys have done, completely. And no one, unlike the my piano guys, the my piano guys, they have technology, uh, the social media, you can release a song now, it will be popular. Uh, Maporisa uh, released Lanchman. Uh, in no time it was no. Uh, but he had not spoken to the Peter Tina family and all that. Beautiful song, and I'm happy because it's one of my favorites. So they didn't have all that because they were recording through cassettes. They had to sell their music in the taxi in the taxi ranks. ranks. The big bosses of the music industry 
did not give them any chance. But they persevered. They work hard. In the book, Oskido explains how he became a DJ. He used to sell a Boulevard's rolls. And one day, by chance, the DJ of the club was not there. And he was asked to come and play. Uh, he played, they liked his music. They said, no, come back again. He came, he sold, he gave his Boulevard's roll tray to some guy. They said, I'm trying to take this thing because He's, he, he talks about the figures there. I think he was earning one point something a night at the time. So he did not need that whatever <laughs> uh, thing. So his story is phenomenal. It's inspiring. Because his father wanted him to be a mechanic. And he left uh, the job he had as a mechanic and all that. So it's one for me, one of the stories that is uh, inspirational. And I'm happy about the book was I wanted a book that can speak to the life uh, uh, and lived experiences of a South African young, young person, especially those who are African, who grew up in villages, in the townships. And uh, I think the book attempts to do that. Uh, and um, the, all the contributors, I think they've come to the party. And um, it's something that uh, you, you, it's a book that you will find interesting uh, when you, 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 you read, I think so. So I thought I should just summarize the book and then we can have a conversation, questions, uh, but we don't have answers. To, <laughs> because I was saying to the VC, I was saying to them, one of the reasons why young people, was most young people, they like the book, they're interested, they're curious. When you say never too young to lead, they come in huge numbers. You know why? My suspicion is that they think there is some recipe inside the book that will help them to oust the old people. Unfortunately, they get disappointed that no, there isn't such a recipe. This is not about saying the old people must live because you need to strike a balance. There's a lot of value uh, in uh, having old people around to help us to uh, lead because they possess a lot of wisdom. Uh, experience is the best teacher. Doesn't matter how many books you have read, but you need experience. And through experience, you develop wisdom and you are able to uh, become a balanced person. So that's why you can grow up and become a leader instantly. It takes a bit of time. There is no self made a man. There's no born leader. Leaders are made. So you need to engage in that process. Let me stop being a politician and uh, <laughs> allow others to talk. Allow others to talk. Others yeah. to talk. Thank you. No, thanks very much, uh, Comrade Lebogang, Honorable. I'm not used to Honorable Maili. I'm used to Comrade Lebo. Uh, and uh, Prof, uh, thanks very much, uh, for your inputs and I think from what you, both of you have said thanks thanks very much I think from what all of you have said uh, you would agree comrade Pat that what I was saying that they are the befitting people to speak on this particular subject in their entire life they have been questioned as too young to lead and I think Comrade Lewis has articulated properly what it then meant in his context and how he has been challenged over years. And I think Prof touched on it, on him, how he was challenged. Uh, you know, when he was coming in also, there was, at that time, Comrade Lewis, the university had tried everyone. The last they would have tried before Fitzgerald would have been uh, Prof Ndevel at the time. He was coming from overseas. Uh, when President Mandela was the chancellor at some stage here, yeah, and then when Prof. Ndebele came in, the Ministry of Education had said, now we have given you the best to resolve the challenges of tough loop. So when Prof. Mahalo was coming in, Comrade Lebo, there was an argument that, but he's too young, man. Then South African, and they said, no, but if all these people have failed, how can this young one make it. So South African Student Congress at the time wrote a committee that 
better the devil we know, let the young scientist save our university. Better the devil we know, was it was an outcry that we have tried every recipe it has failed. Let this one take over now. Our young scientist who's brewed by ourselves. I think that was the affirmation at the time. Comrade Lebo articulated, I always marvel at the journey, Comrade Pet, that Comrade Lebo traveled. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult journey. And that is why, without doubt, George, I can pronounce that he is a leader of our generation. There is no question about it. When you look at all of us who came from that particular period, Comrade Pet and everyone, they, yourself, you left your leaders in Fazia and others who have yet led your recent struggles. But that particular generation, post-democracy, that reshaped the discourse of the South African politics, South African higher education terrain, the general youth struggle. <coughs> Comrade Le would deserve to be bestowed that particular crown of being its leader for the journey he has traveled. In research, when I was still studying research, I also studied. Uh, oh, I prof. <laughs> so when I was studying research, they taught us of something called phenomenological experience. And when you, when you do a phenomenological study design, it's a type of a qualitative study where you must experience something for you to speak about it. So you must live that experience. So when he say he had to go to the private school, not to sell out the revolution, but to, for us to understand what is it, what are we speaking about when we speak about private education. And I think it's correct that the, the, the CIC also supported him. I, I see the CIC t-shirt there, the EFF t-shirt there. <laughs> he was part of that particular generation that articulated what ought to be achieved. But I must not take time because the, the dialogue is with yourself. Important for us is that they would have raised key issues from artificial intelligence that Prof speaking about, which is starting to trail into academia. One of the fears that those who were innovative on computers say, our fear is that in future computers must not think like human beings. But now it's beyond that. Computers are thinking ahead of human beings. That's why you tell them they produce an assignment for you. And these are the realities that your current, this, the current generation, Comrade Pet, needs to deal with. I'm going to welcome you to give inputs, uh, those who want to ask questions, ask questions, but we're not here. They are not carrying a bag of answers, as Comrade Le would have said. They are carrying with themselves a thought-provoking input. So it's for you to think, not only for today, but even beyond. And I think Comrade Lewis has also made a commitment that he is even willing to come back at a particular time as he'll be moving towards the next series to continue to have this conversation, especially that would have read the book. If you check the people, Comrade Lewis, that you spoke about in the book, all of them have a similar, almost a related experience. Ivan Kors was very young to lead Orlando Pirates. Dr. Marwala, even now, when he became the vice chancellor of uh, UN universities, university, he still questioned, but how does this young professor emerge to such high echelons? Uh, you can go on and all on about all of them. But I think it's time now that uh, I take hands. Absolute. Say something. Yeah. Uh, we'll start there at the back. Yeah, you are noted, George. Comrade Pet, no, I should have introduced you. Comrade Pet is one of the leaders who they have led with Comrade Lebo, and I would also want you to give input at some stage. Yeah. Okay, no. Thanks very much uh, to everyone who has honored the invite. I've been watching online, by the way, since I've been doing a lot of work. So, and. Uh, by the virtue of that, I just want to ask you a question because the book uh, is all about uh, never too young to lead. I would want to uh, leadership to introduce yourself so that they know what you are doing. Okay, no, it's fine. Uh, no, thanks very much. Uh, speaking here is uh, Chairman Hankim Patele. I'm the SRC Disability Desk Chairperson and the founder of the Absolute Book Lab. So I deal with books 
Yeah, you are, uh, so my question is that since I've been watching online and this is about uh, never too young to lead, the question is that wh what do we do? Because when young people are introduced to leadership at a very young age, they are even g given incentives. Incentives that mean this is a mandate that you must execute. And should you execute perfectly, this is what you are going to get. Things like money, things like whatever that the uh, uh, people in the higher ranks I don't want to say like you, but it's fine, like you promise young people. So, because it's, it's, it's a, I want to also refer to the Osagi Afo, Kwame Nkrumah. He authored a book of neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism. So what I'm saying is that, I'm, I'm giving an example using you, by the way. People like you give people like Mr. Hani here uh, money to go and execute the mandate. They can just say, okay, go mobilize it and push something, we're going to give you this. You're introducing them to the realms of, uh, I don't want to say leadership, there's not, nothing leadership about ambushing. You're introducing them to the realms of all those things, politics at a very young age, but politics of incentives, which end up, as Chris Honey said, makes them comprador bourgeoisies, people who are likely to sell out the revolution for as long as there is incentive that is coming to their table. So, Dr. Kwame Nguruma went on to say, Warren, Neocolonialism being the last stage of imperialism is the most dangerous and we are aware of it because things are just happening remotely but those who see things differently are still able to see such things. What is your take on that? How do we eradicate things like that whereby we want the leadership to be on a very very good uh, uh, scale? That's the question and uh, this is just an extension by the way since uh, I don't know if I should uh, delegate the vice chancellor or what. I don't feel that powerful. I don't know if I should delegate the vice chancellor. You are having an executive. Chair, le, le, Chairperson, let's go straight to the input so that we have enough time. No, that was the question. Yeah. But since we are dealing with books. As you are concluding. As I'm concluding. Yeah. Since, since we also founded a book club, we would love some donations, please. Thanks. Let's deal with this side and then we'll come to this side. So we are done at the back. We have you here and then uh, the Kappa, Makeda with Kappa, you'll come in. With the Kappa JC, you'll come in later. George? Thanks very much, Chairperson. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Principal Mohalung and uh, President Maili and everyone. Um, according to me, my in my thinking. Okay, let me let me start by what the uh, principal said about uh, the young people of today. He spoke about madness and thinking. Uh, madness and thinking, according to me, versus uh, never too young to lead. According to me, that's my input. Uh, we as young people of today, we, we have a problem, a serious problem of uh, respect. That's why our leaders doesn't take us serious uh, when we are supposed to take uh, uh, the leadership responsibilities. We don't have manners. That's why they doubt us. So I think uh, moving forward, uh, President uh, uh, Mail, you should also uh, touch the issue here, here the manners amongst young people because today, uh, let's say for example in this event, this is a proper event, one young person who has issues with the, uh, let's say pro prof or anyone will just come here and uh, just disrupt this event. It's an issue of manners. So, arena my The other thing is... Uh, as you conclude, hmm? as you conclude, Okay, the other thing is uh, the other thing is um, the manners. Okay, okay. Oh, the issue of um, I want to give an example with the issue of manners versus the issue of money. Uh, as young people today, we see young people having a lot of money. They are they are fortunate to have money, for example, and then they feel like or they are bigger than everything that's why our leaders but doubt our we 
we we can we can we can we can lead as young people thank you thank you very much yeah just there thank you so much uh, i would like to follow the protocol uh, to the vice chancellor professor muhalum i would like to say be greeted and you are a role model to many uh, to honorable maile i'm not sure if i pronounced your name correctly say you, and you want to be the vc <laughs> <laughs> that's on a lighter note uh, anything i just want to go high in the sky <laughs> um my question uh, goes this way relating to to education especially the education of television what is that education and how is that education impacting our youth is it impacting our youth in a good way or is it impacting our youth in a bad way going to the issue of music speaking about the music of men um, like like idrube the old music the music of miramba the the, the 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 likes of the of the anthems of the pan africans wherein we talk about anyone being to africa or you or you or you basizana na batanga wa africa that call to say wake up that wake up call and also a uh, uh, challenging the youth to say let us challenge the uncomfortable questions my mind like mandela said might be angry at the white man but at the end of the day i have to think and after i think we still have to sit down and discuss those uncomfortable questions thank you thank you very much <laughs> yeah uh, yeah Are we done? Oh, give, give the chance. let's take the last one here and then they respond and then you come in don't worry you'll have your time i'm too democratic My name is Mukalapa Benedict. Uh, I am the chairperson and founding president of Azania Youth Empowerment, and I'm also Elena's uh, desk officer at the APC. So my question, uh, I have two, only two questions. The first one, it relates on, it relates on how should uh, ministers like Leborang, Mr. Leborang, and the VC himself, with those professions that they have, then the knowledge of, the knowledge of leadership translate the information and the history of leadership into us? That is the first question. Then the second question is that, what is the next step? After we take the information that we have of, as uh, old leaders or elders to the next generation or the youth, how do we make sure that they continue and it breeds continuity out of that? Because progressiveness is not now, is rarely found in leaders, young leaders. Because they are given information after giving that such information which comes in a form of criticizing by those who led before them. An example, I can say Mr. Mpachele here, he is my leader and a founder of that ABC book club. He is not currently advising us in a way that is proper to show that he has been there. So how do we make sure that Kuchuala Pele, after making sure we teach these kids about leading, and giving them the right incentives for leadership, how do we make sure that Baba Productive and Ojola Bill will give them the right advices? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Let's close it there on this side. Uh, Comrade Lebo, you want to have a bite? And Prof, you'll okay. come in. Okay, no, no. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, absolute from ABC. You, you don't want. Um, uh, 
incentives, but you want us to donate. Uh, that's an incentive. <laughs> so you are, you are contradicting yourself. But I think you are raising <clears throat> an important question about young people being in the pockets of elders. You know, there's somebody who speaks, who speaks about uh, respect and manners. Mm. Uh, one of the things that you can learn from the uh, previous generations, young people who led uh, the revolution or rather who participated. In the book, there's a chapter uh, where I speak to Phoebe, Ambassador Phoebe Borghide, and she speaks about Pitam Gaba. I don't know how many of you know Pitam Gaba. Peter uh, Mukaba has the role, role model of Julius Malay. Mm. If you want to know his role, that, that is his role model. Because, you see, but Peter Mukaba was, uh, I think, one of the most uh, uh, eloquent, energetic, authentic orator uh, South Africa has ever produced an organizer. Uh, you could read the crowds and you will agitate. Mm -hmm. And you are so popular. I think at some point his popularity would have been at Mandiba level. Mm -hmm. Loved by young people. He will say things, kill the boa, kill the farmer. He will say, break the hostels brick by brick. You see, when it comes to rhetoric, agitating the masses, he was uh, at another level par excellence, loved by young people, wherever he goes. But Peter Mukaba subjected himself to his collective. When they called him to order, he never said, I'm bigger than all of you, I'm popular, I'm no, no. He listened to them. He engaged with them, explained himself and all that. So the point I'm raising is that young people must be radical. Young people must be radical. There's no doubt about it. What the prof is talking about, the madness, which is, I think, uh, I think uh, it's Amilka Cabra, if I'm not mistaken, mm. who spoke, if you want to bring change, there must be some element of madness. You can't just bring change if you are saying it. Young people must refuse to understand why things can't be done. They must be radical. But radicalism and discipline are the two sides of the same coin. To be radical does mean, doesn't mean you must be rude, you must be disrespectful. I mean, the VC is old enough to be our father, to be a grandfather to some of them. So you can't, when you speak and say, oh, when you speak to the VC. You might not like the decisions he makes, you might not like the pot, but you must differ with the VC, but with respect. Say, VC, we don't agree, we stand our ground. And these are our facts. So I think for me, uh, what I would call consciousness is very important. Because when you're conscious, you will never be bored. You will never be manipulated. Uh, I was speaking yesterday about, and now it escapes me, about, um, uh, OK, I, I quoted Che Guevara yesterday, when he says that revolutionaries are, gu are guided by great feelings of love. So you can't lead the people that you don't, you don't love. You would sell out the students if you don't love them. If you are not conscientized. If you are not uh, guided by great feelings of love. And that's why you will be bored and you can sell out. But if you are conscious and you understand why you are doing what you are doing and why you are where you are, even if they give you money, you take the money, but you never uh, sell out. You never sell out. So for me, it's more about the issue of consciousness, being aware, understanding what is it that, it, uh, what does it mean to be a leader or to even be an activist, because sometimes we think or rather we elevate leadership over activism. And we also think that leadership is a position or a title. Leadership is not a position or a title. 
There are a lot of people who are leading without positions and titles. Uh, I was talking about uh, yesterday about Tuso Mbedu, who's an actor, who's uh, making waves international. Nomza Mumbata. I was talking about Rulani Mkwen. Okay, Rulani is, as a position is a coach. But at this age, 34 years, you know, Black Kofi has no position except he's a, he's a, uh, what is it? He's CDJs. And he's a, uh, uh, whatever, before him. But Black Kofi is big. If you think Black Kofi is big in South Africa, you don't know anything. Go to Europe. People queue and push each other. In ben, Black Kofi is the first, I think, African, if I'm not mistaken, in many, many years, if there was ever any African who will be performing at Madison Square in New York. You don't just perform there. That's a different stage. If we're in soccer, we say it's La Liga. That's a different stage. You don't play there. Black Kofi is going to play on the 2nd, 7th of October. That's leadership. He's leading the way and all that. So I'm saying for me, uh, all those things, we will donate the books uh, through the executive director. Don't worry. And then it, I dealt with the issue of respect, and I think the VC will pick up uh, on that, even the issue of money. But I want to deal with this issue of media and music, or the role of the media. You know, uh, Donald was saying, he quoted, uh, who's this guy? Uh, Franz Fanon. Uh, when he says, every generation out of relative obscurity must uh, uh, identify, uh, fulfill, or betray its mission. Uh, and I think you are short of saying that every generation also has its own cultural dynamics. Uh, because in the 80s, Huma Sikela, uh, Maria Makeba, Jonas Gwangwa, and all that. By the way, Culture is a special place in every society, the role that it plays. And that's why at the time the songs they were singing and all that. And I don't think you must dismiss the cultural expression and feelings of young people. It's not every uh, I'm a piano song that is not relevant. If you listen to one of the songs I like, Um Seven's Way, by Lady Do. And I think she said, Um Seven's Way. It's talking about our work ethic collectively. It's not, it's to, there's a lot of message there. Um, they might be having a strange way of putting these things. You talk about re, uh, respect and all that. It's about order, it's about discipline, command and control. So I can go on and on about the my piano music and the lyrics and all that, which are relevant. And young people of today can relate to that. Because one of the mistakes we must not do is to insist and try to force young people to be like those who, became, who, who came before them. They, of course, they can be inspired for, by them, but they don't have to be like them. They, there's, there's lessons they can learn from them, but they don't have to be like them. So I think... Um, uh, the issue of how you translate knowledge, I think uh, the prof will better uh, manage that one, how we translate many, uh, uh, yeah, so I think those are the ones I'll take, thanks. Thanks, uh, Honorable MEC. I think I'll start with the one on respect. You know, when you respect somebody, it shows us that you yourself you are a respectable person. Coming to leadership and that, we, we, we talk of ethical leadership, which will address the thing of money. They, they gave me money to, to, to sell out, and I agree with the Honorable MEC that take that money and good and get yourself Malana. <laughs> And, 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 and. You know, respect, ethical leadership, morals, even when you grow up, work ethic, 
That, that's what we're going to expect from you. And that's where you'll be listened to, and that's where you'll take the bait and, and run with it. Granted, we cannot just be all young in it. There should be generational mix to transfer the knowledge, to transfer all that which has been amassed through the years so that you look at it, correct it, and move on. Uh, what did he say about knowledge? Uh, how do older people translate knowledge to the young people, especially in leadership? Well, that's why I said maybe generational mix is the one which will assist. Mm. The younger people learning something from older people. So when you see them old, I didn't know I was a role model to somebody. The, fa <laughs> the first person who said, I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to buy you this book. <laughs> but they, 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 that, 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 that's just how it is. You look at yourself. Another thing, you know, I, I always tell people that your, your actions at times, you're insulting your parents. Because I, I normally ask myself, is this all what your mother could do? <laughs> That's why I say, when, 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 when you come out there and make noise and insult, we, we don't look at you. <laughs> we look at the old lady at home. What was she doing? <laughs> she failed to bring you up now. What do you expect from us? We, we can't correct that which your mother couldn't correct. But that, that's all. I don't know if there's anything yeah. which which. Uh, no, it's fine, Prof. Yeah, for now, uh, thanks for that, uh, on, Comrade Magabe. I want you to to have a bite briefly, and from there I'm going to read the comments. There are some few comments from the our virtual platform, and from there we'll pass to you. Just in brief, Comrade Pet, if you have something to say. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, I think for me what stands out about the book is to challenge this notion of leadership being a purely or a uniquely political uh, phenomenon. Uh, you are basically saying uh, in the book there's leaders in music industry, leaders in soccer, leaders across the board. There's, there's so many areas where the country needs leadership. And the common mistake that is made when we talk about leadership is to assume leadership must be uniquely, exclusively political. And of course, there's a history to that. Part of that history is because during the struggle, the dominant challenge in society was political oppression. And that gave rise to what the need for political leadership. And what emerged uh, in 1994 was basically an expression that this is the epoch of political leadership finding its highest expression. But beyond that, where we are now, almost 30 years later, our challenges as a country, they don't necessarily require only political leadership. We need leadership across the board. And because I'm talking to students here, I think it's important that you internalize that. I'll give an example. Facebook, Apple, Apple the gadget, uh, Microsoft, about 30 years ago, they didn't even exist. Uh, this didn't even exist. But as we speak, those are trillion dollar industries. Those businesses were started by young people. So this book, for me, the best way to read it, especially for you as younger people, is to say what can we do to provide leadership to make sure that in the next 10, 20 years, we produce industries that those of us who would be very old that time would, would have never thought is possible to produce them. <laughs> Thanks very much. And maybe lastly, uh, it was 
Lenin actually who wrote imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, but we'll, we'll deal with that, uh, how capitalism evolved and, yeah, thanks. No thanks. Thanks for that, thanks for that, uh, Comrade Magabe. Uh, there are two questions from online. I think that the other one is a comment. One is from Itumeleng Chidi. He's saying what an informative and thought-provoking session this is. There is indeed power in lived experience, indeed as per what Comrade Donald alludes. My question is where do we find the book? Thanks. I think you'll deal with that. We have Which dealt book? with that. Which book? This one? This one. Oh. John Lekhanyan writes, how does the book balance the idea of never too late to lead with the realities of changing industries and evolving skill requirements? How many copies did you have? Never too late to lead with the realities of changing industries and evolving skill requirements. Never too old to lead. Never too late to lead. Never too late to lead. The, yeah. With the realities of changing industries and evolving skill requirements. That's John Lekhanyan. And he says his last question is How does the book redefine traditional notion of leadership regarding age and experience? The notion of leadership regarding age and experience. Len Musho ask, it, without, it is without any doubt that ideological position is important in shaping any leader. What is the most important tool we can use, Mr. Maile, to fight the ideological degeneration we see in young people? Uh, fight what? To, find, to fight the ideological degeneration we see in young people. Mm. Uh, those are the questions. I don't know whether we must go through them or we must take Let's take the, this side. I'll start with you. Uh, I'm going, please, let's be as brief as it can be possible because you can see you are many and I want everyone captured. I'm going to end with you. I'll start here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Straight to the point. through the, the mic because you see these people, there are a lot of people who are following who are not here. So they would want to learn from your question. Okay. Um, greetings everyone. My name is Dimakazo Tom Mutebe and I'm the treasurer of the School of Social Sciences Council. So my question is, the both, of, both of the speakers both experienced age, age criticism before they assumed the positions they had to assume as young people. So my question is, did it personally affect you in any way or any of your capabilities before you had to assume the position? Thank you. Thank you very much for being straight to the point. Next. Morning. My name is Kamali. I am the chairperson of the ULCJS. My question is, what do you do when you are not taking CGS? ULCJS. Universal Film Popo. Um, or the gender? No, uh? ULCJS. University of Limpopo Criminal Justice Society. Criminal Justice oh. Society. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> my, my question is so, for example, for myself, I'm gay in the world, so, and I'm, I'm, so, 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 so whenever I go anyway in a meeting or a presentation, um, the people there who, who undermine me or do, do, not, do not take me seriously because of my sexuality. So my question is, what will you do if you go to a space where, where when, when you get there, already, already they have their own, their, own, uh, their own assumptions about who you are? So what do you do going forward to, to make them realize that you are a good leader and you are capable of leading a structure? Thank you. Thank you very much. A very good question. Next. No, thank you. Uh, greetings to the MEC, 
and uh, the vice chancellor who is also my role model i hope you know what that means <laughs> So he wants a book. I oh. think he wants a book. <laughs> Is it because you want a book? No, no. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a well-known fact. Uh, my name is Kucho Mamawolo. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Uh, briefly, MEC, uh, I think that uh, as people who are observing uh, trends and what is happening in South Africa, you're the rightful person to be speaking to us as young people. And I must mention that uh, you really do inspire us. And uh, I think there are developments in relation to the conference that you alluded that you contested in routing there might be developments there everything that you've mentioned you said that you wanted to lead a certain structure they said you were too young to lead and you led in the case of routing they said that you were too young to lead and unfortunately you didn't lead but there are developments in that regard which might possibly see you as the the chairperson but i don't want to delve much into politics the other thing that i wanted that i wanted to emphasize on is what uh, you mean now <laughs> The other thing I wanted to emphasize is what was rightfully mentioned here. I think the problem that we are making as young people is to think that leading is only limited to the political sphere. And that is not the case. If you look at people like Jay-Z who have been in the hip-hop industry for a long time, now they are regarded as billionaires and they are leaders in their own right. Now we are having the likes of Cubs that you mentioned. There's no one who's going to have a conversation around Ama Piano without mentioning the name of Cubs or without sitting in a round table discussion with someone like Cubs Ama Puris. So everyone who's here who's not politically affiliated must be an activist in their own right and they must ensure that they champion whatever it is that they are involved in. I'm sitting next to members of the LGBTQI community here. They must not be asking questions as to uh, what is it that you can do for us. They must be activists in their own way and that is the only way in which as young people can actually be listened to without having to say what can you do for me but in our own right find what we stand for and actually fight for it. Thanks. Thank you very much. No, no, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Porto, a member of EFFSC and a deploy of EFFSC to School Council of Education. I'm the chairperson there. So, uh, MEC Comrade Lebaram Maile, I, I, I do realize that now you are the MEC of Infrastructure and Settlement Development in, in Raute. So I just wanted to ask to say, we've had phrases, we've had a lot of things, we've had words just that agitate a, a lot of young people or that agitate activists but how do we move from actually agitating in ways to say we're going to be doing this to actually practicalizing what we are, we are preaching i'm saying this because we have a situation in alexandra wherein people still do not have houses there i think two years ago three years ago they were promised one million houses by the sitting president of the country what uh, are we doing as young people who are leading like you are saying you are never too young to lead you are leading the space now as a young person what are you doing there to affect change what can we as young people actually do to move away from phrases that we are preaching of saying we'll do this we'll do that but actually bring change in society as young people and then also i wanted to ask in relation to the gatekeeping that we see uh, by, by, by old people, more especially in the political space. We see cabinet positions and we see a lot of political positions occupied by young people, uh, not young people, but occupied by old people who do not want to leave the space. What do we do as young people to actually fight our way through into those positions that we can lead? I mean, like, even our, our, our minister of young people is a relatively old people, uh, an old person. What do we do to change that? And also, uh, for, for, for young activists, more especially in universities, I think the events of, uh, I heard you speaking of FIS must fall. FIS must fall, what it brought, we want to believe as young people now who are in the, in the political space in universities that FIS must fall, what it brought is, I'm concluding, I'm concluding, Jay. FIS, <laughs> FIS must fall, what it brought, uh, despite the little change that we see there, wherein we see NSFAS now trying to bridge the gap between the and the, 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 the do not haves and the haves. Uh, what it really brought was fear into the minds of young people. Fear, what I'm trying to say is that with Fist Must Fall, we saw a, a lot of leaders or activists getting suspended. We saw a lot of activists being imprisoned. So, uh, no, I'm no, concluding. No, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, the question actually is directed to yes, uh, uh, to say that how do we deal with this fear now that is in young people? I mean like currently young people cannot 
protest peacefully in their own campuses. What, what I'm trying to say is that I'm not saying we must encourage young people protesting, but what I mean is that when we have issues as young people, the first thing that we think of before you even think of resolving the issue is the parents at home. I'm going to protest here. I'm going to be chucked out of the university. What will then happen to me afterwards? No one will care. So how do we as young people deal with this situation that we're confronted with in universities? Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next. <coughs> My name is Maremo Mpachele. Um, I do not have any leadership positions. As they said, that you do not lead a, a position for you to be a leader. I'm a leader myself. <laughs> so, my question is on um, the... Uh, I'm very happy that we have uh, academics here, especially we have the deputy vice chancellor and prof, uh, the principal. So, in the evolving trends, as we've been growing up, when I was young in the secondary school, there, were, there have been um, debates as to we should include the entrepreneurship courses in all the degrees so that we can encourage students to participate in entrepreneurship. We not only want people who are going to work for people. So now we are also having the, the issue of climate change. They are also saying that we should also introduce the courses of climate change in almost all the degrees because it's affecting everyone. But I'm having a problem with the issue of leadership. Um, as to say in that there is no one who is speaking about introducing the leadership courses in um, or modules in mo almost all the degrees. Because for myself, I believe that a leader is made and a leader is not born. So what is stopping us from trying to educate the, the students or the youth uh, with the leadership courses and integrating them in almost all the degrees? And what is our role as youth in trying to ensure that we have those leadership courses in, the, in almost all our degrees so that we can be made leaders? Last two questions. Ngozga Kol, Chairman of the Session. Igamao Emile, the current sitting chairperson of the School of Economics and Management Council. Uh, I have just two questions that I will try to be brief and short. You spoke about a lady that I can't pronounce the name of who was questioned because of her gender when she was leading during the FISMAS fall campaign. It's still the crisis that we are being faced with in universities where leaders being male leaders still refer to female leaders as dog or instead of seeing them as leadership. And I think even your generation faced the very same crisis and what advice can you give the current generation in fixing those issues? We can reflect on that because the only time the university ever had a female president was during lockdown. It's as of a result of the fact that we are not giving as leaders, male leaders, enough opportunities to female cadres to exist and to challenge positions of leadership. So what advices can you give us in that regard? The second question is, I think it's mostly directed to Prof. You are saying times are changing. We are revolving. There is chat GP currently. But don't you think the reason why students tend to opt for that is them losing faith in what the system offers currently and today? Because had students still having interest in learning, there was never going to be a need for them to consult a machine that's going to do assignments for them. As a result, that I think even the university is noticing that the students are losing interest in learning. The deputy vice chancellor, they've introduced a system of you must attend 75% of, of, of your classes in order for you to enter the exam room. So my question is, don't you think the youth have lost trust and faith in the system? And as leaders, we can't even challenge it as Comrade Potro is saying because we have fear of suspension. So don't you think you should allow us to be mad enough so that you can discover the thinking within that particular madness? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. My name is Poshia Dube. Mine is not a question, but a, a comment a, and a challenge to the university. Uh, we are here today launching a book that says never too young to lead and uh, most of the university management is not necessarily young people. So we want to challenge the university to absorb young people into vital positions of power. Let us not uh, jump uh, to that leap of finding solutions for Africa when we can't find solutions for ourselves within ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Comrade Hani, an activist, a member of the EFF and the EFF Student Command. Uh, 
to the vice chancellor and principal Tobela Paul. Yes. Uh, I want you to at least maybe give us a minute uh, lecture on power because last time I checked you are the most leading vice chancellor in the entire continent. The longest CV. So I want to understand how and why do you get it right? Because a lot of people, when it comes to positions of power, they fail to manage that power. Like uh, they've been saying that there was, uh, within a decade, Comrade Doso said that uh, they changed vice chancellors. But when you came in, what is it that you did right? So that it can be a lesson for us who are also future leaders. Uh, to Comrade Lebogang, uh, we appreciate the fact that uh, you acknowledge the Commander-in-Chief and President of the EFF. <laughs> so, so, meaning is not just because, an inspiration to us only. Because I was leading him in Kosa, so yeah. uh, I'm yeah. glad about my product. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, we appreciate the fact that he doesn't only inspire us, even his peers and those he led with, he inspires them. But, uh, like you are saying that you went to a private uh, school. And then and now, we have seen the conditions of the schools that are there in public, uh, the public ones. Uh, what is your view on that? Because I believe that the mere fact that you went to a private school, you have learned something, one or two. Now you are one of the young people leading in, the, in government. So what is your role and how are you assisting in uh, saving the proper uh, education for other young people who are coming in? Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Let's take the last hand at the back and then we're done uh, for this side. Yeah. Yourself. That, no, that, that one. We'll come this side. Well, you're going to be the only hand this side when we come back. And we'll then take the last hand this side and we'll go to wrapping up. Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Khotsom Langeni. I'm a final year media student. In terms of, manage, in terms of madness thinking, I believe uh, young people hold the power for innovation with their madness thinking. Uh, uh, so uh, how can, can, can I correct something here? Yes. And please do listen carefully. I said, much as there is madness in their thinking, we have to look at the thinking in their madness. Yes. I think you get it right. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so that we must not perpetuate the scenario that said that seeks to say prof said young people are mad. <laughs> no, he has not said that. I think I wanted to, to come at the last on that aspect. But it's important, thanks, Prof, that you came in. He said, what he said is exactly what he has just now said now. He has not said young people are mad, mad. but there is a madness in the thinking. But we need to extract the thinking in that madness. Or well, may I rephrase? Yes. Uh, the, the, the thinking part uh, from the madness, how can young people learn to control this power and use it responsibly and effectively in their respective industries? Thank you very much. Let's take that hand so that we conclude. Is there any hand I would have missed this side? We are covered. Last hand. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mukondo Miso. I am a member of SASAF Student Network. Um, uh, I'm also an agricultural person. I am a model, I'm also an author. I am a student studying public administration, politics, whereby they teach us about power. Um, my, I don't have many questions, but I have many inputs. Um, first one will be Steve Biko. Oh, okay, yeah. I will just summarize them. Yeah. Uh, Steve Biko, according to Steve Biko, in order for our country, South Africa, to be successful, women, women must be put at the forefront of every decision making. That's power. I've been in an agricultural sector as a young female and the only female in my area, Maruleng, if 
in Rasukoro. I'm the only young woman who is practicing agriculture yet practicing modeling. The reason why I went into agriculture yet modeling, those two they don't come together because in other side you are dealing with mud, whereas in other side you dealing with um food security. The reason why I went on both sides was because I want I wanted my voice to be heard. In modeling, I will be given that space where everyone loves to be, where I'll be listened to, and everyone will give me the, an ear. So I forgot to say, I am currently serving the title of Queen of Mataku Mall. Um, there, I was given a platform to say, I am a woman in agriculture, and I seek to be heard. That in this department, we always hear uh, mostly when our president, sorry to say, he always say um, women must be given as equal opportunities. But when I approach many agricultural offices to say, yeah, here I am, they always, I remember this other one once said to me, we don't have a funding in agriculture. Only to find that there is a funding. You are always undermined or sidelined and people don't believe in you. Another one is, I am an author. So, I, I wrote my book when I was 16 years old, but I struggled to publish it. It's called part of the process. It, it is now published with um, the publishing print, Eshap Shuti in Pulukwan. Um, I struggled a lot because of lack of, of opportunity in rural areas. They always preach about how rural areas are disadvantaged, but people in the higher ranks don't take their time to come to the, to the rural areas to check how the work is being done. We are denied opportunities as people from rural areas. I would like, I would also like to add on that, that please ask our leaders also tackle on that matter. The last one is the one of SESOF uh, Student Network. Um, Vice Chancellor, this, is, this one is directed to you. Um, uh, we have been we, we, Sekedi told us, okay, that, okay, he is, she is the, our leader in the, in the, in the sector. She told us that there will be a trip going to, <laughs> so I'd like to plead on behalf of us all that we would like to be given the opportunity to learn more on this department because like we just happened to win and we never really got to learn more because if we can please grant us the opportunity to learn in that department. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Um, I'm told online we are fine. We can respond to more questions online. It's about the book, which is what you are going to address, obviously. But you no, can... No, no. I think, let, let, let me take a few of the questions which were raised on the floor. The, the, idea of sexuality. I think as university we are very conscious about that. That's why we give everyone a chance to express his sexuality. We even have clubs and we even introduced a gender office. All what is needed is advocacy. Let people know that we have got different sexual orientations. So, but if you get somewhere and you ill treated because of your sexual orientation, that will bring me to my next point. That if it's like that, I won't mind signing a letter to say, whoever treated you badly can go home. <laughs> now, somebody was talking about protest and not being allowed to protest. We all have a right to protest, much as there, should, there are certain responsibilities that go with it. As you protest, you don't infringe on the rights of others. <coughs> Where I have got issue with is that because you failed to convince them in a mass meeting or wherever, you go and disrupt their class. They have a right to attend. You have a right to stay away. So if you don't want to go to the class, stay away, protest, but don't go and beat others up who are in a class. 
if they do that, those are the ones we normally escort home. <laughs> uh, how power, we play around with it. You use power responsibly. They normally, I forgot that expression, power given is power exercised or something. Eh? Power borrowed. <laughs> yeah, you see, the politicians know how to put that one together. We're, we're, power is there, you're given that, you just use it responsibly. That's why I say, uh, somebody said, how do we succeed to lead the university for so many years? You're leading people, you're not leading animals. So listen to them and expect them to listen to you too. That's the re recipe for it. You learn to listen to other views. It doesn't mean if you're a vice chancellor, your views should be taken or your views is the correct one always. Courses in leadership, I thought we had it, man. Don't we have them? Uh, uh, in public administration. They do have such courses. So feel free to get into those modules and learn something about leadership. Honorable MC, shall I? Thank you very much, uh, BC. Uh, there's a lot of questions. Some of them are political. and. Uh, but I'll come to how I deal with the political ones, uh, because uh, I can come back for a, a debate with the political people about politics. But I'll still answer those. Uh, uh, but the, f the first question was, where did you find the book? I've, I took a conscious decision that, you see, the, um, the lady was talking about publishing. This book, I'm, I'm self-published. Uh, I, I don't have any publisher. Because I've got issues with the industry. It's not transformed. This book is not in exclusive books. Because it's not transformed. They would have taken 40 to 50% of the proceeds. Uh, this book is non-profit. How many 50%? 70%. Yeah, 70%. And this book is for non-profit making purposes. Through this book, we have raised two million. And that two million is going to fund a lot of initiatives. Uh, it will be taking kids to schools. We are currently building a swimming pool in my former school in Alexandra, Skien Primary. We'll be building a hall for. So if I went to uh, exclusive books, they would have taken what is 70% of 2 million? Yeah, so I would have been left with 600,000 to do all those things. So, but the books, the book is on Amazon electronically, and those who want it as well can go to, uh, okay, Southgate is far. The, the, you can send us an email on our email address. It's never too young to lead dot co. Oh, never too young to lead. At, at Africa dot com. No. Oh, dot we'll Africa. We'll we'll yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you see, you are being bullied. Now I'm being bullied. By <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted him to <laughs> answer. But anyway, so um, that's where the book will be found. Then the second question uh, about bringing a balance about never too late to. To lead with realities of changing the uh, what is it dynamics? And not, okay, I, I just missed this, but uh, it depends what it means and how you understand leadership. Because if your understanding of leadership is that a person has not occupied or led an organization, it might be flawed because this old person, for instance, might have led a family. The leadership responsibility to lead a family, there are a lot of dynamics. In fact, I think a family setup is the best uh, mm. uh, demonstration of leadership because there you've got uh, kids as they grow up, they develop their own minds, they are persuaded by some don't want to go to school, others go to school. So, what the prof was saying about how you are brought up, it becomes a reflection on your parents and all that. 
So I think that's one of the most difficult institutions to lead, a family, because people judge you on your kids, for instance. People judge you on your wife or your husband and all that. So I don't think there's anybody who doesn't lead at any given moment. Uh, there will always be different um, roles in society. Uh, in a relationship uh, with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you lead each other. And that's why you want to always want your boyfriend to not drink a lot, not come late, not misbehave. You are, you are leading because as you engage him, uh, you are actually uh, imparting some skills and all that. You don't want your girlfriend to do this and that. So leadership is a very dynamic uh, uh, phenomenon. It's not about, uh, however, you need to skill yourself. And that's why Prof. Marwala talks about reading, that you must read. Whether it's in the industries or wherever, you must accumulate knowledge. Uh, you must uh, accumulate skills for you to be able to lead. So the age of the, the, the notion of age and experience, uh, Prof did speak about it. I think it's about the balance. Um, as you, and in fact, when you look at most revolutions, they've been led by young people. By the way, when Fidel Castro and uh, Che Guevara and all of them led the July 26 movement, they were young at the time. They're not old. Um, Amilcar Cabral was young, uh, Sankara was young, um, uh, we spoke about our own, yeah, uh, who Pitamukaba, Anton Limbede, the founder of the ACU League in 1944, the, the, the father of Africanism, Pan-Africanism, Steve Biko, you can count them. Uh, in fact, it's difficult to find any revolution that has been successful, which was led by older people, mm. by the way. <laughs> so, because young people are daring, young people have courage, uh, there is madness in something, as the prof was saying and all that, but you have to infuse uh, wisdom, knowledge and all that. So that's why that balance becomes important. In the struggle, those who are young, where shielded by those who were old. And that's why when they were in Robben Island, they were Walter Sisulu, Oliver Tambo was in exile. He, so we can go in on, it's not a, a mm. political history lesson, but I'm, I'm just saying there is a balance, you can't say they separate the two. And then there's a, um, the issue of ideology, what to lose, you know that. So it depends whether you are a social democrat you are a nationalist, you are a liberal, so you'll use the tool that, uh, or the tools that uh, are uh, compatible to your ideological uh, persuasion. Uh, so it's a bit um, open-ended uh, question, uh, vague, but uh, those who are believing in socialism, communism, they will read your Marxism, Leninism, and uh, all the um, um, uh, relevant material, uh, meaning dialectical materialism, uh, historical materialism, and all that to sharpen and make sure. Because remember, we don't live in the conditions of our making. The conditions we find ourselves, we did not choose that we want to live in this condition. We did not want to choose that there will be villages, there will be townships, black people will be poor. We did not choose that. Uh, we will have uh, this institution that has, uh, out of what you said, uh, executive director, out of 23,000, 15,000 kids are NSFAS. dependent on NSFAS. We did not choose that. But because we don't live in the conditions of our own making, that's why at all the times we must understand these conditions. You must read and analyze and understand the trends and all that. Because you can't lead through common sense. Uh, you will not understand all these things. You will not know all these figures if you don't read, you don't research. And therefore, you will not be able to adapt. Peter Mukaba said at the time when he was president of the Youth League that the Youth League must adapt or die. 
So you must adapt uh, as a human being as well. And then, yeah, there is uh, the issue of criticism. Um, someone asked if it affects you. As you, yeah, it does. It gets into you, it puts pressure, and you ask yourself, what if I prove them right and I fail? And all that, then you also put pressure on yourself. But I think it's important to stay focused, but to also understand that leadership is not about many people. One of the biggest problems um, we have these days, people want to be famous, popular, and you know, I don't think leadership is about that. Leadership is about changing the conditions of <laughs> other people, not yours. Uh, it's not promoting yourself. So if you have people now promoting themselves, uh, wanting to be known and all that. I, I, and I think for me, it borders on consciousness uh, amongst others. Um, and then there's an issue about, uh, okay, gatekeeping by all people. No, before that, there was an issue of uh, the, and the prof has spoken about it the LGBTQI uh, community and all that. And, and I think Prof has answered it correctly to say it is the responsibility of the institution as well to make sure that it creates a conducive environment for everyone uh, to uh, feel free and safe uh, and they must be able to express uh, their views. So. It's good that you've got a, a, a VC who's unambiguous and who's saying, if you feel threatened, raise your issue. It doesn't have to be him directly. Your lectures, your own, because once the top leader is clear that in this institution we are not going to allow, um, uh, what do you call it? That kind of discrimination. Discrimination. Uh, I think for me, it's a good start. Uh, and you shouldn't then feel that you you, you have uh, you, you are under siege. Uh, but you must also be assertive. You must be assertive. You must never allow people to bully you because of your sexual orientation. Uh, it's not right. You must be uh, assertive. You must be like Tan. Tan is actually bullying me. Uh, I have complained about him. <laughs> But that voice Yeah, he's, he's pulling me. <laughs> and then the gatekeeping, oh, it will always be there. It will always be there. You don't need permission to lead or to exist. Young people must fight for their space. You don't need com but fighting for your space, it does not mean you must be disrespectful. And that's why someone is talking about fear and all that. That fear would be there. If I was to be a, a VC, I wouldn't allow people to trash campus because they're young people. What kind of behavior is that? You, you can't. Young people can uh, do a sit-in in the VC's office peacefully without uh, trashing anything. Uh, young people can march here without trashing anything. Once you start trashing, that's why the VC says there's a what he uses. Uh, he says they escort you home. Uh, so you shouldn't have fear if you don't commit crime. Because treasuring is committing crime. So you should not have fear if you are raising your views. And you can even win in court if you say, but this VC does not want to listen to us. Uh, I mean, we raise views, we differ with him, then he suspends us. But if the VC goes to court and proves that you are treasuring campus, the court will agree with him. So don't trash campus. Uh, that's not radicalism, that's anarchy. And then the issue of, uh, you raise the issue about practicalizing commitments. You know, it's easy to, it's like, you know, when, when I'm watching Pirates, my team, my criticism, and unfortunately in most cases I'm right. Yesterday I was in class, somebody tells us we are leading, I said, by one knee, I said, no, we're going to draw. And I know the coach do this, that, that. But it's easy. I'm not a coach. I'm not, I've never gone to school. I've never, I, I don't know how to coach. But I've got views and strong views. I, why can't the coach substitute this one? The coach knows why he's playing. The, the. So it's like when you are not governing, you are outside. 
it's easy to say, oh, these people, why are you not doing this or that? When you're not a VC, you will ask, oh, but why the VC is not giving all of us pocket money, at least every month? Then we will like this VC. He must just give us the thousand rand every month. You, know. you, you are not there. So it's like this thing of governing. People always say, you are not giving people houses. You are not doing this. But here are the facts. See, the president said to the people of he was speaking to the people of South Africa, not of Alexander. He was in Alexander. Yes. He was in Alexander. I'm from Alexander, by the way. So there were TV cameras. He said he would build a million houses. So people then assume that you would. If you know Alexander, and I assume you know, you can't even build a thousand houses in Alexander. It's no space. I mean, really, how can the president say, no, you can't? No, no. No, I'm telling you. Wait. Aye, 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 colleagues. No, no, it's fine. Don't worry. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You see now. Wait, wait, no, wait, remember, wait. I'm the... You see no, now. Don't worry, don't worry. No, I want to say to them. You see, we are having a very good conversation. Don't howl. If you feel that you strongly want to raise something, I'll, I'll allow you that particular opportunity. No, don't worry. Sure. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. You, you, you don't have to protect me. Don't worry. So I'm saying you can't even build a thousand houses in Alexander. It's a fact. I'm born and bred in Alexander. I'm MEC of Human Settlement in Alexander. So I'm speaking, I mean, in in, 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 in Gaudi. So I'm speaking with authority. So if you look at what the president, the last time I checked, would have built about 600, 700,000 houses in the country. Uh, in Alexander, you would have, we have identified there's a project called, uh, it's, there's a land owned by Vets, uh, Frankenwald. Uh, there's a, which would yield about 30,000 houses. There's a, another project in um, Linksfield. And, so I can go on and on and on and on and on, on, but I don't want to get to that point. The point I'm raising is that there will be commitments that are made, but there will always be difficulties. One of the difficulties, let me tell you about housing, is that you've got 1.2 million people who need houses in housing to build 1.2 million houses, you need at least 1 trillion rent. The, the housing government budget, it's, not a, it's, it's about 150 billion. That must provide education, health, transport, and all sorts of things. So that's an objective reality. You'll never build 1.2 million houses in housing. And why are you having 1.2 million people live from Limpopo, from Northwest, from all other provinces, because Houghton is supposed to be greener pastures. So we can venture into that about urbanization, in migration, what are the international uh, case studies and all that. So that's why I said you, you, you raise in politics, and I don't have a problem of venturing into that. And we can give you facts. Uh, not about me, I mean this political party, so every opportunity I get, I must criticize that uh, political party, try and show that it's useless and all that, without facts. So, that question is linked to the question about, uh, uh, somebody says I went to a private school. I didn't go, I went to a private school just for a year, by the way. So it's not like I've been to a private school throughout. I've been in a public school for 12 years. 12 years. Then I failed matric. I failed. So when I failed matric, Mary Metcalf was a Ministry of Education, was given an opportunity to get somebody from a township. She then took me to Crawford College. Uh, hopefully to change the condition, I mean, the, the environment and all that, and she thought it will maybe help, which it did. Uh, and then I explained what happened earlier on. So you are asking a question about uh, the conditions in public schools and what is it that we're doing. And you are saying me, unfortunately I don't like talking about myself, but I just did say what is the foundation that 
we have founded is doing, amongst other things. But in Gauteng, uh, you have more than 2,000 schools now, as we speak. The 150 billion budget I was telling you about, 100 billion of it goes to both education and health. Gauteng metric results for the last uh, few years, I don't know how many years, have been one of the best, not in terms of the numbers. By the way, Gauteng has got the largest number of matriculates, followed by, by KZN. It has been quality in terms of the number of bachelors that we produce, the quality, I'm talking about the quality now, meaning the kids that can qualify to go to tertiary institutions. It has been a leading in terms of the number of girls who pass in terms of maths and science. It is the only province in the whole country, despite the fact that uh, tertiary education is not its competence, because you know that the constitution decides on what are the functions of national government, provincial government, and all that. Higher education is a function of national government. But how then government is the only that spends nothing less than 400 million giving bursaries to all the top three kids in all the high schools so that they can access tertiary education despite NSFAS. Despite that there's NSFAS. We don't subject them to NSFAS. We give them through GCRA and all that. We, we, we are building, you will remember, we have what we call the schools of the future. Uh, our kids have, uh, what do you call, um, these things that we use. These things they get for free. And they've got mobile boards. So I can go on and on. But it doesn't mean there are no problems. <laughs> because the problems must be understood in context. They did not start in 1994. The problems in my school, my high school now, I mean, sorry, my primary school, I'm only bring, building them a swimming pool now because if you are government how do you, what you what, when you there's, there's, there's something we call competing priorities so if you've got the money instead of building a swimming pool and building another school a new school what do you do are you going to build a swimming pool here or are you going to build a new school or are you going to get more classes because there's kids and all that so the fact that there is no swimming pool in that school it doesn't mean that government does not want to but government is looking at these resources and say, how do we deploy them the best? And that's why initiatives like this one are important. And for the first time in many years, we're building them a swimming pool. We'll open that swimming pool next month. The other school that I attended, uh, Minerva High School, that I've spent about five years there, we're building them a, a horn. There was an area there which was a formal settlement. I'm talking to the municipality to give us that space so that we, keep, we build them so that they can have a proper hall where they can end. So there, there's so much. But you see, leadership is not about status. And it's also not about uh, bragging. Because you can't then go around saying, yeah, this is what we do and all that. But it shouldn't be assumed that we're not doing enough. We are doing to the best of our ability. And where we have shortcomings, problems, we will say, yeah, it's not possible, this and that. And like I said, there will never be enough uh, resources. If you look at the national budget, which is 1.2 or 3 trillion now, 600 billion of that goes to salaries. 600 billion of that. And look at what goes to higher education, look at what goes to social development. Look. So we can have a, a debate, I can come back, about our fiscal framework and uh, whether government is doing enough or not. But remember, people who are poor, who, are, who live in shacks, they need houses. So it doesn't, this explanation that I'm giving, it, it's, it's immaterial for them. They need houses tomorrow. <laughs> but can we give them houses tomorrow? All of them? It doesn't matter who's the government tomorrow. No, you won't. So we can have that discussion. As I conclude, <laughs> Chair, uh, this is why I said uh, we raised these issues. And I think the issue of curriculum, the prof mm. spoke about it. And it's important, and it's a fair point, that you must have a
curriculum that responds to the prevailing conditions that we find, and that can help us to compete as a country. Uh, and I'm happy that you've got, uh, you're doing uh, agriculture whilst you're a model. I think that's what we need. Uh, but also, one of the things we're doing through the book, we're going to visit rural areas, the libraries, to donate books, but to also we are going to start a project through the Never Too Young to Lead Foundation, where we mobilize because a lot of successful business people and middle class, they're in Haute. So we are going to mobilize them to be part of a program that we call Adopt a Village and Adopt a Township, because that's where they come from. So if somebody adopts their village and they do certain things, they don't have to have millions and to give people names, basic things. Some of them are scientists, for instance. Some of them are accountants. They are mathematicians. They can go in the villages once a month and teach kids about mathematics, about science. So adopting does not mean you must have money. That's what we are going to emphasize, so that you can get as many people as possible to go back to their townships, give back. Some of them are soccer players. They are netball players. Some of them have been going with uh, SA, they are musicians. Why can't they come back and give these lessons and all that? That's what we want to, 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 to do. But thank you very much. You have been a wonderful audience. Uh, and we never expected easy questions. In fact, we will be disappointed if you, you ask the easy questions. Because we expect uh, that you must be robust and you must ask uh, difficult and uncomfortable questions. So don't think that we take offense to that. That's what we, we enjoy. We have been baptized with the revolutionary fire. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Comrade Leo. Thanks very much, Prof. Thanks very much. Uh, I think you, 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 you would have had key issues emerging from uh, what our speakers are saying well, here. Uh, the one thing I like, uh, Prof. Masha, is you, you want to? No. Oh. One thing I like, Prof. Masha, about the students of the University of Limpopo, and uh, Prof. Madaj and Prof. Moto, and I always take an opportunity when it's given to come here, is the robot, robustness and the high level of thinking that is here in terms of even it, that is reflected on their engagements. And I think you deserve a round of applause for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I just would it that one day you migrate into, I want you to remain like that. We must be known like that. That even when, the way we are so robust, even when we discuss, if someone says things we don't like, we give him chance, he says it, and we still robustly engage him. That's what I know you to be like. And thanks for always being like that. This has been a very thought-provoking session led by people who phenomenologically lived the experience. They, they, they have been part of what they are speaking about. So our indeed our take home is that one, young people must rise. You need to go and read that particular book. Where you think there are shortfall, feel free to critique it. We have an email here uh, that they promise is info info at never too young to lead dot africa info at never too young to lead dot africa I've, i i strongly believe that even after you have read the book you have criti you want to critique it you are free to also say to send uh, because i know the book club one of the things that we do in the book club after reading, we express, we critique every book that we read. So you, have, you must feel free to actually do that. Uh, Comrade Lebogang has books that he's going to give. Because of time, he may not be able to sign all of them, but I think he'll sign 10. 
completely. You can sign, yeah, you can sign, or you'll sign three. Uh, the first copy will, of the signed book will obviously go to the book club uh, for the keep of the book club. Uh, let's give them a round of applause for that. <laughs> to the extent level that you have chosen the University of Limpopo as an area outside Gauteng where you need to have really have this dialogue, we really appreciate, I think, as a university. The person who's coming to do a vote of thanks will come on that, but I must really, really sincerely uh, appreciate you and prof uh, thanks for continuing to make the university a center of engagement because i think i'm seeing this trend that university is becoming a center of engagement on any other issue on daily basis when i follow the university uh, online i see uh, it's like every almost every day we have key people from all over the world coming to the university to give, to have discussion on various issues. And I think that is applaudable. We really, really appreciate that because if we are to be a university that pride itself with excellence and striving to find solution to Africa, we must be part of a daily, daily dialogues. We must discuss what our people are faced with on a daily basis. And to the extent that we have the type of students who are not fearful to engage, you know, in the past, if you are to call this type of a dialogue, you are not promising people food and all that. You will have very, very few people for this type of discussions. But you see the eagerness and the willingness to learn and absorb issues, which is what we really commend. So we, we, we commend you for that. Tatu um, Makap and Levu Levu's team for even come here to support Comrade Levu. That is appreciable because we can only do, he can only do that much. He has provoked discussion. It's never too young to lead. Young people must rise. This book comes at a time when we are pondering with serious challenges that we are facing, both as a nation and as a continent around inequality, poverty, and unemployment, especially among the youth. So at a time, Comrade Pet, when the older are refusing to die, and the young are striving to be born. Now this book comes at the right time, Comrade uh, Lebo, so we appreciate you for that write-up. Indeed, we have no doubt when we crown you a leader of a generation in this particular country, not within the ranks of the ruling party, but in the country for the contribution we have made to the youth development trajectory in this particular country. I don't think there is any amongst us who would have contributed uh, to the youth development trajectory like you have done. That is much appreciated and round of applause for that. <laughs> My work end up here. Uh, whether you choose to give me a round of applause is up to you. But I'm done. I'm handing over to the executive director, to the entire management of the university once again from our part. Thanks very much for always uh, Prof. Matasha, Prof. Maudu, Prof. Ma Masha for always saving this type of session. Uh, come and take over the right. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. President. Are we, are we gonna call Prof. Madaje to, to give vote of, a vote of thanks. Thanks, Prof, again. I, I know your, your office has got a long queue now going to the ground floor. And MEC, I, I like the fact that you are willing to take the young people on, you know, because when, when you discourage them from asking questions, then that's where they go underground and go para, paralegal, paranormal, and all those things that we don't, we don't want to, to stand. Uh, I, just let me clarify, how many books did we say we have? Okay, then I assume there will be a copy for each one, no, 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 far more than that. No, 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 Prof. One sixty. Really? I thought this set about one or eight. Yeah. All right. But but what I'm asking you to do is this, please. Two things. Hey. Yeah, the hundred and one. 
So there's a Chinese proverb. It is better to do without books than to believe everything they say. When you read this book, think for yourselves, judge for yourself. But don't judge before you have read the book also. There's a, there's a tendency now with social media that people will take a book and they'll go to Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and say, I've got a copy of the book by the MEC and that will be the end of it. But then they will want to have an opinion about what the book says. Do you understand what I mean? Please, I ask you, do not fall into that trap. This is not about you be, it's not about relevance on social media. It's about challenging you to think and maybe find your leadership, the leader in, the leader in you. The second thing is, do not take it and put it on a shelf. This is how you read, and I know I'm not patronizing you. I meet some of you at 2 a.m. coming to, from study halls. If you, if you just take 10 pages a day, if you just take 10 pages a day, this book is less than 300 pages. If you just take 10 pages a day, in less than a month you would have finished it. And if you think 10 pages is a lot, before you wake up, before you go onto Facebook, read five pages. When you sleep, don't fall with your phone in your face. Read five pages. You would have read ten pages a day. While you're waiting for your friend or class to start, read a page. While you're waiting for a bus, while you're on a taxi, I'm saying these things because I know we don't read. We collect books, we don't read them. It will be a, a real snub to the MEC and a young person that he is that you don't read this book. I hope MEC, if we ask you to do video or Zoom sessions so that they can take you on on some of the contents, they can ask questions, you'll be, you'll be available. And I'm saying Zoom because I know you'll be having to go to other varsities as well and go to other places. But thank you very much. Uh, Prof. Madaji is our Deputy Vice Chancellor Teaching and Learning. I'm sure he would like to give us a vote of thanks. Prof. Is this mic okay, Brajo? Yes, yes. He can use this, so he doesn't need this one. Oh, thanks very much. I should not take too long. And I know some of you are hungry. So I think in five minutes' time, I should be done. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Victor Homoswana uh, for having been a very good program director. Uh, he piloted this plane so well, it took off safely, uh, traveled safely, and landed safely. Can we give him a big round of applause? <laughs> Our thanks and gratitude go to the Vice Chancellor, Prof. Mukhalum. As you have seen, he leads by example, these leadership qualities are exemplary, you have seen that, and we are extremely proud in the sense that currently in the country is the longest serving vice chancellor. Yes, <laughs> and uh, not only in the country, we were also doing some research, even on the continent of Africa. So can we give him a big round of applause? <laughs> and indeed, the Vice Chancellor has been a, a good role model, I think, for almost all of us. And uh, some of us, I think, grew under his wings uh, from childhood as it were, up to where we are. So we cannot thank him enough. Our um, Honorable MEC, uh, Maile, you too, we cannot thank you enough in the sense that you chose us. There are about 26 public universities in the country, but you chose us to be one of the first, and uh, we are highly grateful that um, you have launched a very constructive project 
And uh, your message was that the youth must not sit back and wait for things to happen. They have to work very hard. And I trust our students have listened to you and uh, they are going to emulate what you have done and what you have achieved. In fact, there's no greater leadership qualities than what you have shown today. As you said, you are not going to get a cent from this book, but the money that the book is going to generate is going to be uh, donated uh, to needy uh, students and learners. And through that, it shows that indeed you are a leader of the people. In Sipedi, we will say, Hoshi ki Hoshi Kabat. In Machivenda language, we are going to say, Kosindi Kosi Ngabat. You can only become a good leader if indeed you serve your people. Can we give him a big round of applause? <laughs> and of course, we'll also like to thank your entourage, all of them, staff members in your office, uh, Comrade Magabe as well. And I know some of them are extremely busy wherever they are located, but they chose to be here. And that's being patriotic in nature because they want to see young people growing and become better citizens in future. Our thanks also go to Ntate Silamulela, the president of our alumni and convocation, for being so dedicated to the well-being of the university. In fact, I was so envious of him that one day when he finds time, let him come back into academia uh, and offer to teach one module. Is it in pharmacy or optometry? <laughs> yes, I think in pharmacy. Uh, those who are doing the health sciences uh, can also learn a lot from him. Can we give him a good round of applause? <laughs> he was an excellent moderator. Our thanks and gratitude also go to the registrar and of course Professor Mautu representing the executive deans. I see Ntate Moloto, chief of HR, as well as Professor Mato, uh, who takes care of our students with disabilities, Dr. Mapopa, uh, executive director of the library, I also saw Silo from the strategy office of the Vice Chancellor and many others. I may not have mentioned you by name, but uh, you are included. Now our very important stakeholders, the students, of course, represented here by the SRC. We would like to thank you highly for your attendance and especially uh, for interacting with MEC Maile in a very constructive manner, uh, posing a difficult but necessary question or questions. One of the things I noted here was the issue of ageism, where students are saying the older generation must move out <laughs> so that we can come in. And uh, MEC my land, the VC answered it so well. There must be some form of balance. That if it is only the youth on their own, think of what is going to happen. You need some steady hand to give you proper guidance. Then you'll go very far. There was a workshop on this issue and one of the answers was Rather than getting rid of the older generation, you better create more opportunities. That if there is one loaf of bread, you better bake two loaves of bread. And then you will achieve more success. 
And uh, I don't have to repeat the questions that you have posed, but I think you did extremely well. And for that reason, can you give yourselves a big round of applause? <laughs> when our gratitude also uh, goes to our ICT officials and the media in general, and uh, it's through them that we are able to be had and using technology. Lastly, I would call back uh, Victor. I don't see him any longer here so that uh, he can come and do the necessary announcements. Thanks very much and I wish you well. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Matas. Dr. Mapopa, I didn't see you. I saw a student. <laughs> I saw a student, but I, I suppose you spend more time with students than any of us because of your role at the, <laughs> the library. But thank you very much, Prof. Madaje, and, and everybody for, for having joined this. And to those who joined us online as well, we appreciate you. Virtual meetings are the reality of our times.